on this. So uh, first of all, let me introduce our guests. We'll start here with uh, Nicola Willis, National Party candidate in Wellington Central, former advisor to John Key, and if you look at list rankings, one of the ones to watch in the National Party, she has the highest list ranking for a new candidate. For a round of applause. Then we have Lisa Close from New Zealand First, who is running in the uh, Oharyu uh, electorate, which we can definitely say is an interesting <laughs> one now, isn't it? One to watch. Uh, Lisa is also a political and media advisor in the uh, New Zealand First Party and previously in the Green Party, which is, I think, would have made a weird change. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jan Logie from the Green Party, of course, social development spokesperson and state services uh, spokesperson. Um, Jan has uh, drawn a lot of attention for her vocal support of uh, victims of sexual abuse and of course for being detained in Sri Lanka for raising human rights abuses over there. Welcome, Jan. Uh, we have Grant Robertson, our local uh, Wellington Central local electorate MP, my electorate MP, um, a very important figure in the resurgent <coughs> Labour Party and finance spokesperson for Labour. And of course we have Jess Simmons from uh, the Opportunities Party deputy leader, Wellington Central candidate, former Treasury economist, and you can't get past it without cracking a cat joke, so I'm not going to, but keep your mind. And then Raywin Barna, um, the candidate for the Māori Party, of course herself a social worker of 30 years, a uh, national executive uh, member here of the SSPAM, and she tells me being a mother and a grandmother is definitely her biggest job. Mm. Uh, so what we've decided to do is we'll let each of the candidates take a couple of minutes uh, just to introduce themselves to you and explain why they are running for the party that they are running for. I will be running a stopwatch. I'm sure nobody will talk over two minutes, but in case they do, we will be interrupting. So, Raywin, I'm sorry, but we will start at the far end. Would you like to give us uh, your two-minute political pitch? Awesome. Um, two minutes for Māori is actually pretty hard because that's just my pepeha. But anyway, so, so I won't do my pepeha, my full pepeha. So my name's Raywin Barna, and I hail from Watangiro, the centre of the universe up at Ngāpuhi. And um, on the other side of my whakapapa, I'm Indian and Irish. Why am I standing for the Māori Party? I'm a grassroots, urbanised Māori, Indian, Irish chick that wants to make a difference. I'm not naive to the fact that standing in um, Papakura, I, that I will get in, because I don't believe I will, but I'm standing so people have the opportunity to give their party vote to Māori Party. Uh, so I'm standing because I believe in us as Māori being um, indigenous to this country, inviting in whānau, that we all have the right to participate and love this country as well as acknowledge the indigenous people of this country. Nā mahi. Oh. Thank you very much, Raywood. Jeff. Sorry, I'm going to stand because I'm a, a real fidgeter. Um, Kia ora koutou. my name is Jeff Simmons. I am the candidate for Wellington Central and Deputy Leader of the Opportunities Party. Why did we set up uh, the Opportunities Party? Well, because we've had decades of government, both red and blue, with a lot of our uh, social indicators heading south. You know, housing affordability, uh, water quality, uh, prison populations have all, have all uh, you know, well, in that case, increased uh, under, uh, under both Labour and national governments. We are about not, not left, not right, but just what works. And uh, what we, I think what we've seen in the, in the voluntary and community sector from, from the left is t they've tended to favour you know, government delivery of services. Um, and on the right, what we've seen is, is you know, their preference is for, is for private delivery of, of uh, government services. And they'll kind of involve the voluntary and community sector if you guys can do it really cheaply. Um, so, what, but we think that actually the voluntary and community sector bring a, a huge amount to, uh, you know, to the table uh, on two major things. First, honouring tiriti. Mm. Uh, we, a, a part of honouring tiriti is rangatiratanga. And that means giving people more say over the services that affect them. And that doesn't just have to be Māori communities, it can be all communities. And we think actually all New Zealand communities want that, want that input into, into local services. And secondly, you know, effectiveness. New Zealand doesn't invest 
where, where they get the best return on investment. I mean, we see in our health sector, we invest in keeping people alive for a couple of weeks at the end of their lives, rather than in prevention, with intervention with mental health and with physical health. Uh, we invest in locking someone up 100,000 bucks a year uh, instead of investing in uh, you know, communities and, uh, and what keeps people out of prison. Uh, so we want to see the government investing in the place where it, where it makes sense, regardless of the politics. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, kia ora nga mihi nui ke koutou katoa. Uh, greetings everybody, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today. I joined the Labour Party after um, many years of activism in education. Um, in particular against user pays in education where I used to chase Lockwood Smith around the country and uh, do all that kind of thing. And the reason I joined the Labour Party at the end of that was that I had done a huge amount of work with a whole lot of other people, but we hadn't changed much. In fact, we'd changed almost nothing in the first half of the 1990s when I was doing that. And so I joined the Labour Party because I knew it could change things. And that's what it did when we were in government last time. And I don't agree with um, what Jeff says about, you know, it's left, it doesn't mean if it's left or right. Your value base matters. And I joined the Labour Party because it's about social justice. It's about every single New Zealander living a life of dignity and security and hope. <coughs> It's not about dividing us, it's about bringing us together and saying when we work together we can be the best country in the world. And I also am part of the Labour Party because the way we measure success isn't just numbers on a spreadsheet, it's actually what we can do to make people's lives better. And I'm the finance spokesperson now and I'm really pleased to have that role because that means that we can bring to finance and the economy the social heart that we need. The economy is not an end in itself. It is the means by which we help create decent lives for people. That's why I'm in the Labour Party. Thank you, John. Jan. Tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi nui kia koutou. It's really lovely to be with you here today. So the question we were asked to answer is why we're in our party and why we're standing. So for me, um, I spent most of my life thinking that political parties <laughs> kind of sucked and I was pretty sceptical of most politicians, if I'm honest. Like I watched it and it looked like they were just fighting all the time and didn't really care about our communities. I spent most of my working life working in the community and being really inspired by the change I saw happening in individual people's lives and in communities when we came together. But then there was a time, um, I was working for the YWCA, when we were trying to campaign for paid parental leave, New Zealand, one of the last developed countries in the world to get it. And there was a minister at that time who worked with us, who we got to network with and tell, she would tell us what the other ministers were saying that meant they weren't supporting it. And we would go out and create media stories to be able to counter that argument and show there was support for it. And I thought, oh, huh, <laughs> okay, maybe the system could be used for us. And so for me, that's why I'm in politics, is I want there to be a strong link between our communities and the place that makes the decision. And for me, the Green Party was the obvious place because it's got a holistic worldview. It's about protecting the planet and our people and decisions being made as close to and as often as possible by the people most affected by them. And so I'm really proud to be in the Greens. And this election, we're campaigning on issues that we've put on the parliamentary agenda. So ending child poverty, taking action finally on climate change, and protecting and cleaning up our environment. And underlying all of that is community. So I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion. Kelda. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Close, and I'm really pleased to represent New Zealand First here today. Um, I'm probably most uh, well known for a campaign I started in 2010 um, speaking out for the survivors of domestic violence in a campaign called It's Still Not OK. Um, we brought together about 3,000 women from across Aotearoa and we um, went to the government to address the issue of what happened to people once they'd left those relationships and how difficult it was. 
what I learned from that experience is, is that there's a vast gap, a vast gap between what people are experiencing on the ground, what service providers see and experience, and what ministers and politicians think is happening. And that really concerned me. And it drove me on to work for both the ministry, a number of ministries, and finally into Parliament. The reason why I've chosen New Zealand First is, is for a very practical reason. New Zealand First is the only party that doesn't represent one specific sector or one group of New Zealanders. And it therefore doesn't sit with one ideology. And what that means is that we are not hampered by positions already set. And what I've seen happens within New Zealand First is that we're happy to go out and to listen to both service users, people on the ground, and service providers. And so for me, New Zealand First was the best fit because the policies that were coming out were based on common sense and practical solutions. Thank you. Uh, kia ora everybody, I'm Nicola Willis, I'm Nationals candidate here in Wellington Central and I've got a background um, in farming and trade and politics and I'm a mum, I'm raising four children uh, here together with my husband. And I am standing in politics because I believe that Parliament is the place where we can really make a difference for other people. And I'm conscious that New Zealand has given me great things, I've had wonderful opportunities in this country and I know that I will be able to give my children a great life here. My concern is for those people who don't have those opportunities. And I believe that together we can make this a more prosperous country that offers more choices and a better life for more New Zealanders. And at the heart of my belief about how we do that is a little bit of scepticism about government. I don't think government has a monopoly on good ideas or getting things done. I think we have to work with the grassroots, with people like you and non-government organisations to get your ideas, your understanding of what works on the ground and to truly partner with you to make a difference to families and children who need our care. I also fundamentally believe that we are more able to do that, we are more able to support families, children and our services when we have a wealthier country, when we have a pro more prosperous country that is growing and has more funds to invest. And I agree with Grant. We don't just measure a country based on its GDP or its growth rate. Those things are important because what they do is they enable the other things that we care about and that is our people. Um, and I strongly support this government's approach with better public service targets, with reforming Moranga Tamariki, uh, with taking a social investment approach to ensure that we intervene early. These are concepts I want to see continue to be delivered. I don't want them disrupted. I don't want them interrupted. I want us to continue this work. And that's why I'm standing for the National Party at this election. Thank you. Thank you, all about, yes, thank you very much for your thoughts on that. So uh, we'll open the floor now to questions. Um, as you can see, Brenda's got a microphone. There are three microphones roving, so just poke your hand up in the air and uh, we'll spot. We already have a question over there. So I don't know if, if you wouldn't mind going over there and uh, popping the microphone. In the meantime, I'll get us started with just one question I'm dying to ask. Uh, last night, and Nicola, this one's for you. Mm -hmm. Last night in the election debate between the leaders, mm. uh, Bill English said that he was committing to lifting 100,000 kids out of poverty. Mm -hmm. How is he going to do that, and how much is he going to rely on the people in, these room, in this room and the organisations represented here? Yeah. Thank you for that question, because I was so pleased that he had that moment in the debate last night. Because for weeks, and I think Jeff and Grant can attest to this, I have been saying in public meetings, this government is committed to reducing the number of children in material hardship. We have a plan to do that. And there are two parts to that plan, Heather. The first is our family incomes package. That package, which gets loosely referred to as tax cuts by our opponents, actually focuses support most on those in lower income families, both for accommodation supplements and tax credits for, uh, for children. And what the impact of that package is, is on 1 April, it will increase the incomes of families with children so that approximately 50,000 of them will be lifted out of what we define as material hardship, as defined uh, by uh, the Ministry of Social Development. 
So that is a great step forward. And, and the principle there is if you want to make children grow up in better circumstances, putting money in the back pockets of their parents is a really good place to start. But we know that's not the only thing. Um, obviously, we want to do another package like that. We want to keep growing the economy so we can do another package like that if we have a second term, and that will lift another 50,000 children out. But we have to get to the root causes of poverty. That's about creating jobs, but it's also about intervening early so that where there's been long-term welfare dependency or domestic violence or addiction, we are solving those problems at the grassroots. And programs like Family Start that have proven to be effective and other programs that we know we have data to say work are the kinds of things we want to get behind as a government. We believe getting in early works and we're committed to a social investment approach that paired with raising family incomes will reduce child poverty in this country. Thank you, Nicola. I'm sure we'll want to talk a little bit more about social investment uh, throughout the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So um, your question over there. Hi, my name's Diane Garrett. I work for Family Works New Zealand. Um, my question is for Grant Robertson. Grant, um, can you please tell us uh, what la the Labour Party's approach to social investment is and how it differs from the National Party's approach, please? Sure. Thanks, Diane. Thank you for the question. Uh, when, when we have a conversation about social investment, it usually gets broken down into a number of core things. So Nicola's already mentioned one of those, which is, which is early intervention. Um, the other thing that you hear about a lot is the idea of trying to break down the silos between agencies and make sure that they're working together better. And then the third element is often around the use of data and information that's out there to help drive you know, evidence-based policy making. All of those things are very, very sensible and things that actually we've been advocating for a very, very long time. Putting the label social investment on top of it, I think, um, turns the excellent and important work that you all do and that the ministries do into some form of actuarial politics. Because what actually that is, is about seeing people as liabilities on a balance sheet, which they're not. They're people. They're people who live complex lives in communities. And so I believe in early intervention strongly. I believe in evidence-based policy making. It's why we want to fund early childhood education properly. It's why we want to make sure that we do do paid parental leave. It's all of those things. And I definitely believe in reforming the Public Finance Act and the State Sector Act to make sure that those agencies are working better with you. But I don't subscribe to the idea that this is some form of actuarial politics where you can draw these very artificial measures out. I also think we run the, a distinct risk of cliff edge politics, which is where if someone's just on the wrong side of this very narrowly defined uh, uh, equation for who gets support, then they don't get any support. Okay. And I also think it denies the broader and wider community role in lifting um, up the outcomes of all New Zealanders. And I could go on and on here, but I'll just give one example of that. Um, stable housing is one of the most important things in terms of how we define a successful life for somebody. And that's actually not about the economic value so much of that house, but by, about the stability it provides in a community. If we break everything down into these narrow uh, uh, um, constructs that are formed by seeing people as liabilities on a balance sheet, then we won't do that. So, of course we believe in investing in people, of course we believe in a social system that has all of those things, but I think the motivation for the government social investment programme is how they can spend less money, and that is not what it should be about. So Grant, just before you, you sit down, does that mean that in government Labor would dismantle the social investment agency? Yeah, I mean, it, it almost certainly it won't be an independent agency. Um, and, and our belief is that that's because that work needs to come back inside the ministries. I, ironically, it will do less for bringing um, agencies together than they think. And I only briefly skated over it. But there's much more work to do in the Public Finance Act, in the State Sector Act, about breaking the silos and the fiefdoms of government agencies down and being much more about the outcomes. And then that means including this group of people in the room and how we create that. I'll just give you one example of that. Jacinda Ardern's had a bill in the private members ballot um, for some time now to alter the Public Finance Act so we set actual measures for child poverty reduction based on working with youth folk and then the next Minister of Finance <laughs> has to report on those things at budget time. 
So the Public Finance Act will oblige you. That's a, that, to me, is an example of how you do real social investment. Thank you. This is a question for all of you. Long question, short answers, obviously, <laughs> six of you. Um, Connor Twyford, General Manager of Wellington Sexual Abuse Help. We know that domestic and sexual violence are intimately connected, but this is specifically about sexual violence. Um, if you were the minister leading the work program on sexual violence, what would you do in the first 100 days, given our precarious financial position, our agencies, and how would you see our sector being sustainably involved in the policy design process? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so what we'll do is if we could just get a brief answer from each of you, starting with you, Raywin. And just walk, walk down the line. I guess for the first 100 days, or what I'd do is, is that I would consult with all of those people who are active in the um, sexual abuse field and say to them, I've got 100 days to make a difference, let's do this together. Let's sit down around the table and start talking about, you know, your terrain. Um, we've worked on this train before, let's, let's look at what, what hasn't worked, what we can do together to make it work. <coughs> uh, not build a new prison. Uh, and that would give you a billion dollars to invest in, uh, in the stuff that prevents uh, putting the need to put people in prison, of which I think investing in things like women's refuges is, is part of that solution. Yeah, um, we've got lots of things we want to do in our first 100 days, and one of them would be to reverse uh, Nationals' tax cuts so that we actually have the revenue that would be going into those so that we can spend it on other matters. In terms of your specific um, question, Connor, it is, I know it sounds like a boring answer, but it is actually about bringing everybody in to talk about how we do this together. And that was the philosophy we tried to put in place with Pathways to Partnership, um, which we didn't get to fully um, implement. But that idea that you are part of the solution and that we will work with you to develop that program is critical. Um, so I would actually, I think that is really important in terms of the way going forward. I think in the first 100 days it would be committing to a plan and around, so not the details of it, but that we will be collaboratively developing a plan to end gender-based violence and make the connections between sexual violence, domestic violence, and child abuse, and break down those silos that are causing so much harm at the moment. Thank you. Um, in the first 100 days, I think what would be most important is that we recognise that service providers um, were quite willing to have a look at a social investment approach because it wasn't working before, and so this was perhaps a different way of looking at it, but they can now see that the government is actually ignoring evidence rather than using it, and I think that there is clear information and research available on that sexual violence sector that have been ignored to date and we would be looking seriously at that and how we could bring that together to form a vision about what we want that service area to look like. Thank you, Lisa. Nicola? Uh, first, I'd thank you for your work um, and the important contribution that you make um, to the lives of men. Uh, and then I would say, um, my goodness, this was a really big promotion and I'm not sure I deserved it, um, <laughs> to, to be the minister. Um, and then I would say, can you come in and talk to us about what we can do to make it easier? How can we streamline your relationship with government so that you're not wasting time on compliance and you're getting to focus on the work that makes a difference? And how can we make sure that we take your ideas in at the design stage of any new policy or program rather than after the fact? Great question. Thank you for that. Do you have a question there, Brenda? Um, we um, fought quite a long battle over the last months about the issue of um, MSD wanting to wanting these organisations to collect identifiable data on the clients, and I'd like to hear a really strong and clear commitment from from all of you about whether you think that's a good idea or whether if you're in in part of a, a government that you would um, oppose that idea. Okay, thank you, Brenda. We'll start with you, Nicola, and just work our way down here. So I understand that you're now sitting down with the Social Investment Agency and the Privacy Commissioner to come up with an approach that works for everyone uh, and that works for you, and I think that's a really good approach because you need to be brought into the solution uh, and you need to be brought into the approach or it won't work. So I think that collaborative um, approach is good and good on you for getting it to that point. We absolutely oppose um, service providers having to gather data as a requirement of funding. Absolutely oppose. Um, 
sexual violence sector have managed to avoid that at this point and I don't know why the domestic violence hasn't been included in that and I'm really concerned about that. Also we have issues about the whole data collection process. You know there's clear research out there that by trying to target a specific group rather than mixing it with the universal response as well as targeting, we know that the actual numbers of children who are at risk of being in a benefit, um, the numbers of those who only have none or one risk factor is higher than the number of children who have three or more risk factors. So that just seems crazy. You know, it's like needle in a haystack stuff. Um, so no, we, we oppose putting clients at risk. We know that domestic violence survivors and, and sexual violence people are going to struggle to be able to share their information and get support under that kind of circumstance. So no, absolutely not. Um, the Greens, we've been opposing this all the way. Um, it is, it's a dangerous policy and it's deeply disturbing to me that it is not off the table yet, particularly considering you know, the absolute mess <laughs> they made of the process up to this point. You know, where they, they were being advised not to do this and that the minister just pushed it through. I think, um, and you know, we've had the discussion in select committee of asking the minister if this is off the table, and it's not. So this is, or should be, an election issue, I hope, for everyone in this room. We get that actually there are many barriers for people going to get help as it is already, there's stigma, there's shame, there's dealing with your own you know, concept of the problem. Um, the idea that your information, that your name would be sent to government, that's a step too far, that is another barrier that will put people's lives at risk mm. and we can't support it. Okay. Um, the, the first thing I want to do is actually pay tribute to Jan for the advocacy work that she's done on this issue in Parliament. Um, it's been absolutely superb. Um, my colleague Carmel Cipolloni has been supporting um, Jan on that and asking questions about it in Parliament as well. I absolutely endorse what both Lisa and Jan have said. We do not support this collection of identifiable data. We oppose it and we actually don't really understand what the government's trying to achieve here. The one thing I'd add to what Jan has said is actually about the relationships that you all have with the people that you work with. And all of you know that that relationship of trust when you're dealing with people who are often in incredibly vulnerable situations can be breached at any moment. You know, I just see a tiny little window of that with the work, advocacy work I do as an electorate MP and that it can break instantly. And how on earth does the government think it's the right thing to do to put pressure on you to put that relationship of trust with the people you work with in danger? It's just wrong. Yeah, I agree with, <coughs> totally agree with Grant on that. I mean, that's the big advantage of having you guys deliver these services is that you're not seen as government. And that's what puts a lot of people off engaging with government on a lot of cases because they think, you know, that they're going to have their kids taken off them or whatever. Um, so I totally agree. Uh, we need, uh, you know, we, we oppose this. And I actually, uh, I don't want to get into the geeky details, but I used, to, I used to evaluate volunteering community sector services when I was in the UK. And um, there's other better ways of doing this than what is being proposed. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it's completely unnecessary. Um, I was part of the group with SPA that actually opposed it, so obviously we stand against it. One of the things that I love about our, our co-leader, Marama Fox, is, is that she will always say whatever's put forward, we go back out and we consult with our members. I don't believe that um, it is safe at all. It breaches every uh, confidentiality for whanau. So oppose. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks. So we have a question down the back. Uh, kia ora, I'm Deb Galling. I'm from um, Family Works Otago. Sorry, can't hear me. Yep. Um, I'm, I can hear a lot of the um, talk at the moment is about trying to put more money into families' hands, which is great. We want that to happen. How are you going to support families through education? Um, you know, half the time getting kids to school, having to buy the books, having to pay for the resources, having to pay every week for different um, activities and stuff that they have to do. How are, we, how are you going to address the teacher shortages, high classroom numbers for kids? 
Was that education? A question for anybody in particular? Or for everybody? Anybody who can answer Does it. anybody want to take that one up? Me? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> you go, we'll start with yeah. you, Jan, and then we'll just... Um, oh, Jan, yeah. you start, I'll, I'll direct you. I'll just start on that. I think that this election we've got a very clear choice. Um, when we hear about the idea of tax cuts being the answer to poverty, um, we have to recognise that that is less money for us to be able to respond to our core social issues and provide for our core social infrastructure. So that is less money for our community services, that is less money for our already on the edge health system and education system. So on one hand you've got the government that's saying tax cuts, on the other hand you've got at least the Labour and the Green Party who are saying we don't support those tax cuts actually, we support a bit more in terms of um, tax take and a reinvestment in those core social structures that protect us all and give us opportunities in life. Thank you, Jan. Look, this is, this is really is probably one of the most critical areas in this election, as Jan's pointed out. So in terms to answer your question directly in education, we are looking at significantly increasing resources in that area to address the issues you want. When Jeff gets up in a minute, he's going to talk about early childhood education, which he should, because that is you know, the, an area where we know from evidence we should be putting funding in. Um, while participation has increased in early childhood education, funding for quality early childhood education has decreased. Um, in, in real terms, and so we have committed um, nearly $300 million to bump that up so that schools, uh, the early childhood centres actually have the f funding to provide the services they need and not ask parents for more and more money. In the compulsory sector, a host of different things, but to zero in on one that comes up all the time uh, in my work, um, the so-called voluntary donations, which actually have now crept in closer and closer to things that are core to a person's experience of their education. You know, things like art supplies and things like that. So what we have said is to any school that will say we will not charge a so-called voluntary donation, we will give them an extra $150 per child. So, but they have to commit to not charging for that donation so that actually all the children in the school will actually get the resources that they need. Um, we've got a host of other initiatives that are around um, supporting um, you know, better educational outcomes that I'm happy to talk to you about later on. Thank you, Grant. Jim? Yeah, this is, um, <clears throat> this is one area, the early, early childhood area is one area where actually the evidence suggests that a universal approach is, is most successful. So just going back to the comments about social investment before, if we actually really want to uh, you know, in, invest uh, in the, our future citizens, the best time to do that is early and is through a, a proportionate universal system. So you, know, you make sure everyone has uh, a certain level of services and you can uh, you know, top that up in some cases for the, for the really high risk uh, areas. Our proposal is, is twofold in this area because you know, just a couple of stats on this, Half of families with kids under five experience, po experience a year of poverty. I find that staggering, that 50% of our families with kids under five experience poverty for at least a year during that time. Uh, a, a chunk of those, a quarter of those experiencing it for most of those five years. So that's why a universal approach works with these, with these people. Uh, and a lot of these kids are turning up to school two years behind their classmates. They never catch that up. No education system, no matter how much money you put into it, can ever help those kids to catch up. So two things there. We want to invest in making sure that all families with kids under three get 200 bucks a week, no questions asked. That's, in, that's, that's a, a universal approach. Currently our paid parental leave approach is regressive. You know, richer families get more, which I think is, is absolutely balmy. Uh, and secondly, uh, free, full-time, high-quality early childhood education. So it has to be not just the, uh, you know, the uh, whatever proportion of teachers that are, uh, are currently, it's 50%, isn't it? Is that right, Grant? What was that, sorry, Jeff? I was well, listening to you. Of, oh, <laughs> nothing new there, Grant. Um, <laughs> but we no, want them no, all highly trained, and, we, and yeah. kids should be in there, uh, you know, full-time as well. So that allows um, those children ending up at school to not be two years behind their classmates. Thank you, Jeff. Nicola. I think at the heart of your question is a really um, 
a clear point, which is can we have family incomes increasing through a tax reduction package and have increased investment into public services? And the answer is yes. And in fact, this government has a record of prioritising funding increases for education, uh, as you talk about. You know, overall funding into schools has gone up about 38%, while the school rolls only increased by about 5%. And what we've seen is good results out of that. So we have seen, um, in addition to the doubling in funding for early childhood education, more children accessing that. And, and these guys dismiss that as, oh, that's just about participation. But participation is so important because that's about going after that last 3 or 5% of children that most need early childhood education and are least likely to get it. And we've made a better public service target out of that, and it's a real focus for us. Looking to the future, our focus in schools is to really ensure that we are putting the most funding for the most at-risk children. And we are going to get rid of the decile funding system because we don't want people being labelled or their school being labelled <coughs> according to the socioeconomic status of their community. Instead, we want funds to follow the most at-risk children and to increase funding for them. And I think that's going to be a great step forward for those children. But you know, over the past few years, we have prioritised things for families because it is hard. You know, I, I'm lucky I've got a very supportive wider whanau and I've got a very supportive husband, but still some days just getting the lunchboxes packed and everyone to school on time is tough. And we have realised that and we have done things like make doctor's visits free for every child under the age of 13. Uh, and those things are achievable within the context of a government that is managing the government finance as well. You know, just one last point on tax reductions, because there's often this point made that higher income earners will get tax reductions. Well, look, Labor have a policy that they want to give a $3,000 uh, grant to anyone who has a baby. And that policy would have meant that over the last seven years, I would have got $12,000 from the Labor Party. And I don't think that's appropriate, because I didn't need that money. And I would much rather that money was targeted through a tax package that puts accommodation supplements into families that need it, tax credits into families that need it, and reduces taxes for those on the minimum wage. So I think National's approach stands up. You can have tax reductions and better public services. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, we'll go Raywin and then Lisa. <coughs> yeah, I just... Can you hear me? Um, I was actually raised in a whānau where we were incredibly poor, but we were all raised with amazing ethics. So the Māori Party, we've got our educational policy, you can have a look at it on our website. One of the things that Tūrurua says is, is that it's about knowing ko waiau, who are you? Going back to knowing um, about our identity. I disagree with um, who can bring your education up in two years with somebody who's been behind because I've taken on nine kids at the moment who I look after. They're not all my mukapuna, I call them my mukapuna. One boy who's now 10 came to me, couldn't read or write. This year. He's been with us now for three years. This year he's the top of his class. And he's the top of his class because we inputted into him who he was and we gave him that he was in a safe environment. I mean, I grew up with poverty. I grew up having Māori bread and watercress um, inside that Māori bread all my life. As an adult, I hate Māori bread. But anyway, <laughs> um, I guess my so whole point is, is that I don't just see it as being poverty, because even though I grew up in a big whānau, we didn't have money. I had huge ethics from my father, huge values, and I got educated on um, Māori bread and watercress. <laughs> so what I want to say is, is that um, education is about our whānau. For the Māori party, we go back to the identity to support that education. Um, New Zealand First uh, education policy is based around not being satisfied being under the OECD average for both primary and secondary school um, education. Um, absolutely an investment and not a cost when it comes to education. I also wanted to touch on the issues that we're well aware of, those issues that come through the school gate, those outside issues that are impacting on teachers' ability um, and the things that they have to cope with inside the classroom. Um, not, we're not satisfied with the hardship package. We think it's a drop in the bucket. Once you take everything out, it's more like $17 than $25, and it depends on the number of children you have and actually what that actually impacts on you. Um, those rates are not going to raise 100,000 children out of poverty. In fact, they're worse than they were before the financial crisis. So what I would like to say, um, and the thing that I was missing from last night's debate around poverty, is that New Zealand First is also focused on the, fu on the future 
focus. So while we're doing these things now, and I have to say, why are we doing them next year and not done them this year, if we were so concerned, but also, why are we not future-proofing them? Why are we not linking these rates, these tax cuts, not tax cuts, I should say, these tax benefits to things like the minimum wage, to the cost of living? This is going to be fine for a little, for, for 50000 for a little while, and then it's all going to move again, and we're going to be behind again. And if we were serious, we'd be protecting our children, just like we're protecting our elderly. These should be linked so that they move along with the cost of living and the minimum wage. I think thank that's you, Lisa. No, thank brilliant you. answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question over here with Brenda. Another one. The, the question's going to come from Mana, who's a youth um, advocate for Voice Bucket Online, who we've, we've been hearing from, and he asked me to introduce him. So here he is, and he's got a question. Hi, guys. Um, so you talk about um, supporting families and you talk about um, providing them with um, opportunities to succeed. But how do we change in New Zealand the working culture against young people who are vulnerable and in care? Because currently there are 5,000, maybe 350 kids in care currently, um, and 60, more than 60% of those kids are Māori. So I guess my question is to you, how do we actually depoliticize the issue and do you think that it's an opportunity to come together and actually contribute rather than using it as I'm sorry to say it a bit of political football because these are young people mm. so I just want to ask that question to you yeah. great question thank you um, look, really great question, uh, and I think there's a couple of bits there. The first is um, your point, which is actually we want fewer children in care. We want more children to be able to stay with their families um, if they are able to. Um, so, sorry, we want in the care of the state. We want fewer in the care of the state and more being able to stay in their families. So that means supporting families before things get really bad so that they have the strength and resilience to continue to be uh, raising their children well. But the second bit is around can we have some bipartisanship around the way that we look after children and care and make sure we're hearing the voices of young people? And I, I was really moved. I went to the opening of Oranga Tamariki, and I, I don't, I'm going to be careful because I'll let these people speak for themselves, but I feel like there is a bit of a consensus that we needed to change what we were doing um, with SIFs and that that has been shared across the parliament. And the thing that really moved me was meeting the young people who were part of the panel that consulted and advised on what needed to change with SIFs to make it better. And you guys, I think, are the thing that gives me real confidence that we will fundamentally change the way that we do this in this country. We need to keep listening to you and support you to be brave so that if it's not working, you say that in clear and uncertain terms and we, as the policy makers, change it. Um, my personal view on this is, is back to that word future-proofing. And there are some issues in New Zealand that I think should be non-negotiable. And the well-being of our children at risk that require protection from the state should be something that remains fixed, regardless of what governments are in or not in. And we've seen review after review after review of our child, youth and family services. And now we have yet, yet another model and what I want to see is something that's fixed across the parties, that's a non-negotiable, that won't change at each election, that secures your rights and the rights of the children coming in behind you. Mm. Thanks. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora for the question, and it is a really important one. And I've got to say, um, for me and my time in Parliament, this has been um, one of the things that I've found the most difficult because it is so incredibly important. And we know our history of abuse of children in care and the social stigma and the history of child protection being used as a tool of colonization as well. Like we have really big, big issues and some of those are continuing today. So this is something I wanted cross-party consensus on. Mm. And there were some changes that have been made are great, you know? 
the raising of the age voice, there are some, um, and, to, and the changes around youth justice that are so exciting. But also in the legislation, there were things in this process, like in my time of parliament, there was the green paper, there was the white paper, there was the vulnerable children's bill, then there was the first child, youth and family bill, and then there was the last bill. And every single one of them went from the voices of young people in our community and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and took away people's vision of what was needed. Because what was originally being said was we need to rebuild our communities to give Fano a space to thrive and to support the well-being of our children within their families and their whanos. And if that's not going to work, then we need really well-resourced systems to be able to support those young people. And that they should be involving, that should be a bicultural model. And we have not seen that. What we've seen is the government enabling the privatisation of services so that potentially now security guards could be uplifting children at some time in the future. With, and we have seen the removal of the Fano First Principle, which is, came out of a very, very long history and was critically important. And the legislation is more confusing mm. than it has ever been, which potentially puts children's lives at risk. So. I hope that in government we get to work with the communities and work with young people and work with the National Party to find points of agreement to be able to move a way forward. But, but it, was, it was just an absolutely awful process from my perspective and we couldn't support it. Thank you, Jen. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I strongly endorse what Jan has said. Uh, the first step for me is that the old saying that if you don't learn from your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And that's why we have so strongly pushed for a full, proper government inquiry, Royal Commission, whatever you want to call it, into the abuse of people in state care in New Zealand. Um, and I, I'll be really blunt with you, I don't think we'll resolve the future until we do that until we understand what's happened and what it's meant and how we can improve the experiences. I'm in no way diminishing the current experience of, of young people in state care, but what I'm saying is until we get that right, um, we, we really will not be able to resolve ourselves for the future. And, and you know, I won't digress too long on that, but there's been a lot of talk about gangs and things lately. We want to know where gangs started in, in New Zealand, the big gangs started in New Zealand. They started in, in state yeah. care in Apuni and, and places like that. And so we actually have to be honest with ourselves about that. In terms of the, of the current situation, uh, you know, I, I really do agree with Jan. There were some things that have happened that are really good, and the voice issue is really important. It's a friend of mine, Hawani Jeremy Lambert, who's um, leading some of that work, and I've talked to him about what he's doing, and it's awesome awesome stuff and I think we need to really, really support and encourage that. But we still have, as Jan's, oh, and Jan's actually, I'm just repeating what Jan said because she knows so much about all of this, but, but the Fano first issue was really important to us. The best interests of the child are of course the most important and paramount thing. But the Fano first approach allowed you to say, <laughs> can we make this work in a Fano setting? Can we make this work where the best supports are? And by confusing that picture and by, by, by changing the legislation, we just ended up in a situation where I think we were going to make outcomes worse, not better. And that's also why we couldn't support it. And just one little thing, not the Ministry of Vulnerable Children, uh, the Ministry for Children. Aye. Thank you, I agree with Grant on the on the need for a review on state care, and the one thing I would add is, you know, is, is the linkages with our prison population, and you know the fact that uh, the children of people in prison are five times more likely to end up there themselves. So you know, if we are going to lock people up, uh, which I think we should do a whole lot less of, you know, we're, we're twice the OECD average at the moment, and we think we should be at least average. Um, <coughs> That's all, that's all we want, it's just New Zealand to be average. Yeah, yeah, that's, that should be our billboard day, make New Zealand average. Um, 
but if we are going to put people in prison, let's make sure that their yeah, children don't follow in their footsteps. And that requires, again, an, an investment, which, which, by the way, we'd be able to afford if we were putting less people in prison. Um, the, the comment I wanted to make, I, I really want to endorse what Lisa said as well. This is probably the, one of the first times I've ever agreed with New Zealand first on anything. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the comment about you know, the need for a cross-party consensus that, that outlasts, um, that out, outlasts uh, you know, a certain parliament on, on the rights of the child, uh, and that's, in our view, that's called the Constitution. Uh, and we think, we, that's why we're calling for a constitution that uh, not only honours the treaty, but uh, embeds the rights of the, of, of the child within it, so that no government can, uh, can act outside of that. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, actually I am standing. Um, there's this whakatauki, uh, and this whakatauki goes like this, in a wa o mua. So we go back to our past to look forward. Mm. Uh, and when I think of Poao Te Atatū, and I think of all the mahi that went into that, yes. and I think of Matua Whāngai, Aye. and I hear the kōrero from Pru Kapua yesterday around um, why they set up uh, Te Ropu uh, Wahini Toko Iti Ora, then I have to say that if we want to get it right, then we need to go in a while or more, go back into the past and look at those things that we actually had. I know they weren't, because in 1989, when the legislation changed, there was just over 10,000 um, mokopuna in care, that within that year, it dropped down to 5,000 where we are at now. And that was dropped down because we had that poor te atatū. That was our founding, um, that was our founding framework within, back then, DSW. Those things worked. Mātua Whangai worked. You can't tell me that in this country, or even outside of this country, because we returned a lot of mokopuna back to their countries, Samoa, Tonga, England, I think when the legislation changed. It was all about fiscally driven. We then had to stop uh, sending kids back. We had to stop bringing busloads of whānau up from Pōneke to Tamaki Makoto for hui to get kids back. So in a while more, there's a lot of research that's already been done. Māori Party, if you had to have a look on our website with our policies, we want to put more navigators and to do that whakapapa research. Because without us, you can't do the effective work that you need for our mokopuna. And I say that with all respect, because we know our whānau. That if you bought, and it happens all the time, people say to me, Ray, when this whānau are really dysfunctional, then I say to them, actually, there's a square who lives in Waka, da 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 da. Because we know our whānau, there's actually a whānau down at Thamaranui. So we need to be working with um, our whānau to get our mokopuna back in to whānau. And there are safe whānau. Thank you, Raymond. All right, we have time for one more question, but we do have to keep it quite short. So you could do a Paddy Gower kind of quick fire one if you want. <laughs> Please don't um, do a Paddy Gower. Yeah, um, Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is uh, Tim Metcalf from Jigsaw Whanganui. Um, my question, quick answer from everybody, big one. Um, I'm just absolutely overwhelmed by the massive levels of bureaucracy in our country. It happens in our social service sector. Don't get me started on that. But I'll give you a glaring <laughs> example from the health sector. Um, the Whanganui DHB, I understand, employs approximately 1,000 people. 450 of those people are not frontline staff. They're not OTs, physios. They're essentially paper shufflers, pen pushers. And we see the same thing happening in you know, Ministry of Social Development and everything. And I realise we have 450, um, no disrespect to them, pen pushers in Whanganui DHB who are shoving stuff to, I don't know how many pen pushers there are in the MOH here in Wellington, <laughs> must be thousands. So my question is, how are we going to reduce these massive levels of bureaucracy that are continually uh, hampering the country? Good easy. question, thank you for that. We'll start with you, Rowan. I guess, um, for me, one of the things is, is that the DHBs, I'll speak um, about Tamaki Makaurau because I'm from up there, um, is, is that they need to start working with the policies in line of, of hiring staff for who they have in terms of their clientele. So I know that we're constantly challenging them in, tam in Tamaki Makaro, especially in counties, that the delivery for Māori, you're not hiring the staff that can meet the needs for our people. Because if you do hire people who know our community, you won't need as many pen pushers. Hmm. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> as a former pen pusher, I first have to say that some pens are really heavy. <laughs> <laughs> quite difficult to push, and some pen pushers do a great job. Uh, but I take your point. 
Uh, fundamentally, what we have, uh, what the issue that we have, and, and again, we've had this over multiple governments, is a lack of trust, a desire to measure outputs and have everyone report and be accountable on things mm -hmm. rather than just be trusted to get on and do their job because actually that's why they're there because they're there because they care and you just let them get on with it. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's very much our position that you don't make a pig fatter by weighing it. Uh, you know, you, you just don't bother trying to measure these outputs and outcomes, just let mm. them get on with it. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Chef. Yep. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Tim. As the Member of Parliament for pen pushers in Wellington Central, um, <laughs> you know, um, supportive of them. But look, yeah, I, I also agree. Two quick points, and there's many we could make. Just come back to the fact that a lot of this is driven by the requirements out of the legislation, out of the Public Finance Act, out of the State Sector Act. Way too much siloing. So we've got to get that right and get the public servants themselves aware of exactly what they're trying to achieve. And they, as Jeff said, want to be a part of that. That's why they're there. But they are caught up in this just as much as you folk are. And then the second point is the one I made earlier about returning more to the trust, the high trust models that we were trying to get to with Pathways to Partnership, to strip out the layers of that and say, we've agreed with you what you're going to achieve and we're going to fund you to do that and we're not going to have so much of this. And, you know, and, and I just see so much circular behaviour, 30 second story here, that um, um, Shakti, the, um, here in Wellington, who just went through, and Jan and others have been part of, and myself and others have been part of trying to get funding for Shakti, the, the, the refuge for, for ethnic women. And, you know, they went through so many and so many and so many hoops, and they got a needs assessment paid for, and it said that there was a need, and then MSD said there wasn't a need, and we went round and round and round. It's so unnecessary, it's so unnecessary, and so we can do much better on that. Okay, we did get them funding in the end. <laughs> um, so many potential answers to that one. I mean, how long have we been having this conversation about over the top compliance costs and reporting measures and the number of places you're having to do that to? Uh, like 20 years plus? Um, so it's time that we got it sorted, and, I, and I'm agreeing with Grant in terms of the needing to look at the Public Finance Act to break down those silos so that we can streamline that. There's been good discussion. But part of it also is that point of, at the moment, the government thinks you are there to do the work of government <laughs> at the community level. And so that creates a whole lot of compliance costs because you need to report to them on how well you're doing on their, their agenda. Well, actually, if we shifted that around and said it was your agenda of you responding to your community need and providing feedback to government on what government policies could change to help, um, we, might, we might change the way that the system works. And really, you know, we've had that idea of bottom-up as a kind of a strength-based model for a long time, and I think we need a bit more of that in government. Cool. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, New Zealand First absolutely shares your frustration with bureaucracy, um, I can say that for sure, and we, we want to have a look at, at different ways of doing things, and one of the things that we're looking at in terms of our low productivity rate is actually moving bureaucracy back out to the regions that they serve, and we believe that will bring people closer together and actually improve pro productivity and reduce um, bureaucracy. Um, in terms of health, um, we are clearly unhappy with the funding model at the moment. We believe that should be population based and we believe it should be ring fenced so that it's not going to administrative purposes. The other thing that I'd like to bring up in answer to your question is that New Zealand First has fought vigorously and even put a members bill in to have a look at what government better public service targets are doing to service providers and how they're being affected by government's targets. Um, that we've seen in the Salvation Army also has pointed out that the service provision is changing so that it fits in with these targets rather than the other way around. And what New Zealand First has done is called for an audit, uh, a government audit, um, to have a look at actually are these targets actually succeeding or are we just pushing the numbers around? Um, and they've refused to do that. But we'll keep, continue on that vein. Thank you very much, Lisa. Nicola. Uh, look, from a principled perspective, I've got a lot of sympathy. We want resources on the front line where they're making a difference, not um, in, in the bureaucracy. Um, at the same time, I know that that bureaucracy are often incredibly hard-working public servants 
who are doing their absolute best to be innovative about how they implement policy and how they work with others, and we do need to enable that. Um, I do want to mention the piece of work that the DIA are doing at the moment, where they are looking at the whole way government contracts, both with local government and with non-government organisations. Um, they, we have all heard the feedback that says that everyone said for years about this, there being too much compliance uh, in the way those contracting relationships are. They have been given a mandate to streamline those processes and make it easier for you so you can get on and do your work. So um, I'm really encouraged by that piece of work and I think it's something uh, that we should all stay close to. It's a pity Act wasn't here, although these six have kind of done them out of a job, right? Because <laughs> that's their big thing. Hey, um, guys, thank you very much for your questions from the floor. They've been really insightful. It's been really interesting to, to be able to listen in on this. I think if there's a takeaway uh, from this afternoon, I would say it's that every single person on this stage has promised to listen to the people in this room in government. So I think you can take a bit of heart from that. And um, they may have different ideas for the way they're going to do things, but I think we can fairly say that they all have the country's best interests at heart. So if I could ask you just to join me in a round of applause for our guests.